Okay, cool. I think we're connected. Are we finally connected after all that? <laughs> I think so, guys. We had some technical difficulties, <laughs> but we finally got it up. <laughs> so that's exciting. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Russ. My real name is Nachum Russell, but most of you can say that. So I became Russ. And this is my friend Meg. Um, and Meg is from Megan Trains Dogs. I think you're in Chicago. Chicago. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yep. And you want to tell us a little bit about where you are, what you do, and your program? Um, so I am an in-home dog trainer. Um, I train dogs, obviously, um, you know, with people in their homes in real time. Um, I used to do uh, board and trains at a facility, um, and I quit that and then started doing this on my own. Um, and it was, it's worked out really great. So that's what I do. And I, I specialize in a lot of anxiety cases and, um, some, some aggression too. So, cool. so what I'm interested in discussing over here is like, and obviously if people have questions, they're more than welcome to throw up questions and we can go wherever people want this to go, really wherever you want this to go. But I'm sure. curious about how you got into training, um, your background to this. I know that you have an interesting story that most of us dog trainers don't have. Uh, and I'd love to hear about that. And I'm sure everybody wants to know about that. So I, um, I started as a zookeeper way back in the day. I'm, I'm way older than you. Um, I was about 18 and I started at the Brookfield zoo in Chicago. Um, and I worked in the, uh, primate area in the tropic world. And I, trained. I, I mean, I was a zookeeper. I mean, I, I took care of all sorts of animals. And so um, it was what I'd always wanted to do, even as a little kid. It was like, I will be a zookeeper. So that was my sole purpose in life was to get to that point. Um, and I worked at three different zoos. Um, and I ended up getting into training sort of accidentally. And there was a um, uh, this an mixed animal show at Brookfield in the children's zoo. And they were like, Hey, you know, we need somebody to do it. Cause you think you could do it. And I was like, Oh, okay. I mean, I was young and was fearless. Didn't know any better. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. And I was training, um, working with a monkey, a capuchin monkey. Um, that's cool. that's where, yeah, it was hilarious. She was so horrible. And I learned how to train that from from then on i was like i got bit by the training bug and that was it and then i did a sea lion show i did a bird of prey show i worked birds of prey um and that really taught me a lot about training um you know if you can train birds you can train anything because they're really yeah tough. you mentioned that the other night when you were doing your live chat i'm curious what you mean by that what about birds is so that if you can train a bird you could train anything is it just because they have bird brains like they're stupid or it's <laughs> Well, yeah, kind of. I mean, so they're kind of dumb, but they're not, it's not that they're dumb. It's that they, um, you have to be able to read them well. Um, and being able to read birds well is difficult because they hide what they're thinking and what they're feeling. And so you've got to be really good at reading nonverbal cues, which is, which it, which taught me a lot, you know, birds will be fine until they're like dead. Right. Like you wouldn't, you have to, there's like the subtlest changes in their way they're looking by the way they're, you know, their feathers look. Um, so you have to be really good at noticing nonverbal stuff. And that's where it got really. Um, that's what it's all about. Trip animals yeah yeah it got really really good after that and 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 they don't care either like birds of prey don't give a crap if you like them or not like they just they're just food motivated so my timing you know you, you, it was food it was uh behavior <laughs> and it was it was nonverbal cues so that was it they're like that's that's all it is and um that's what made it really me a much better trainer actually and how long how long did he work with zoo animals Oh God. Um, I worked at three different zoos, 15 years, probably. Wow. Uh, I worked as a giraffe keeper, um, uh, training giraffes to like target, um, you know, like there was a lot of, a lot of zoo keeping is training. So you, you do, it's called husbandry training. Mm -hmm. So it's like getting animals to move from one 
cage to another, move from one, um, you know, uh, area to another and using training, like uh, getting them to target. So like um, I would use my fist um, and a sea lions. That's how we got them to move around was that they would put their nose up to your fist and you would tell them to target and you would could move them that way. Kind of like Lauren. That was the yeah, absolutely. But it was with your it was with your fist, and then you just taught them to target, and that's how you got them to go from place to place. So you had a massive head start than most other tra dog trainers because, like, <laughs> dog trainers, it's like everyone's like, "Wow, you can train a dog," but like this lady's like training giraffes and monkeys and like big deal, <laughs> dog, <laughs> right? It's like uh, you for sure learned a tremendous amount from from that that you probably use on a daily basis that many of us can learn from in terms of just. Because you can't use, as far as I understand, you can't use any sort of correction with zoo animals, right? Nope. So it was all positive only. It was only, um, I could use, um, you know, withholding of food. We did that. Um, and it wasn't like we withheld food, uh, you know, until they were starving and we did it. We did a lot of like um, withholding of food for several hours and just, timed it differently so so animals would think that they were starving to death even though they were getting fed the same amount that day it was just right. we changed the time a little bit so playing with their head um, a little bit yeah yeah we did and it was called we called it psychological hunger especially in birds so you would weigh your bird so a, a, a hawk would be weighed every day my hawk she had to weigh a certain amount in order to fly she if she didn't if she weighed two grams more than she was supposed to, she would have, she just sat there. She was like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, exactly. So I would weigh out her food and I would time it knowing what time of day that we would be having a show. And I would give her this, she would get three mice say for that day, but it would vary. The time would vary. So she, in that 24 hour period, she got the same amount of food, but it would change the time. And so she thought, Oh, I'm starving. And so she would she would fly. So if that makes any sense. It's so interesting. And <clears throat> I think that like, especially as balance trainers, um, and I know a lot of people watching on here are, are trainers and mainly balance trainers. So for those people who are watching who don't know what balance training is, balance training is essentially where we teach dogs everything they should do using positive reinforcement. We teach dogs everything they shouldn't do using some sort of consequence, punishment, whatever word makes you feel good, correction, but some sort of negative consequence to that behavior. And then once the dogs understand that, what they should do, then we hold them accountable for not listening to us. That's a basic summary of balance training very quickly. And obviously every trainer has their own spin on that. But yeah. I think for us balance trainers, I can speak for myself at least that there's a lot of us who probably can work on our positive reinforcement a little bit and learning how to get better with that. And you probably have a massive head start on that, that most of us don't have coming from a, coming from a world where that's all you are allowed to use. And then all you needed to really add in with the dogs was just like, okay, I can teach them everything. All I need to do is add in this one small part, which is the, the correction part of it. Right. Yes, essentially. And, and it was kind of interesting because I, when I started training dogs, um, I worked with a balance trainer. I didn't know at the time there was balance training. Like mm -hmm. I didn't, I had no idea. And, um, I had never trained dogs. I mean, I, you know, it was never my thing. And, and I, I even knew, even when I worked at the zoo, I was like, there's gotta be a way. It makes it really, really hard if you're only using one side of the equation. So if I'm only ever saying yes to you, you know, tr behaviors would take forever to train right. because I could never tell the sea lion, you know, I know I don't want you to move that way. I want you to move this way. So I had to like catch them in the act. I had to, you know, so it took a long, long time. And when I started working with dogs, I was like, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And when I started doing it and adding, I added, I think my first experience with any kind of correction was a star mark collar at okay. the time. And I was like, well, this could, this makes sense. And then I found balance training. Cause I'm like, oh, it's a thing. <laughs> it's an right. actual thing. So right. I was like, oh, I, you know, it's going to be kind of difficult to put a prong collar on a giraffe though. So it'd be like, and when you're up against an animal like that, it's like you, you can't use some sort of my strength against yours. Cause they're always going to win. No, ex Well, yeah. And, and it was, it got, you know, when I did sea lions, I, um, 
you know, I thought I knew what I was doing. You know, and now I look back at it and I'm like, oh my God. I, I was not clear in the way I was communicating at one point with a, I had three sea lions out on working and I, I clearly didn't express what I wanted for this one sea lion. I'll never forget it. Her name is Elaine. And she just, she didn't do what I thought she was supposed to do. And I didn't, I ignored it because that was what we're supposed to do. So she didn't follow instructions and I ignored it. Well, she didn't think she clearly thought she did it. So when I turned away to walk away, she bit me and it was bad. It was yeah. really bad. I can imagine like, a dog bite like it, times a lot. <laughs> it was bad. And, um, you know, everyone in the, no one in the audience really caught it, but the staff did. Yeah. And they were all like, Oh, you know, and I finished the show, but I was really rattled. And I learned that day that, if your dog or your animal, whatever it is, doesn't do what you want, it's not the dog's fault. It's not the sea lion's fault. It's my fault for not communicating clearly what I wanted. And I learned that from a trainer a long time ago, old trainer. And he was like, listen, you take responsibility for your communication, then your communication gets real good. Instead of blaming the dog or blaming the animal for a mistake, it's probably you just not communicating clearly. It's such a key thing right there. That I, I think so many owners and even trainers, I think, miss that point many times of like, the dog is not an asshole. Maybe we should focus on who's holding the leash. Like, yeah. what's really I going know. on here? Why did the dog do that? How was it able to do that? What's going on in the situation that the dog even wanted to do whatever it did that was wrong. And like, like Terry Harris commented, communication is everything. Like, absolutely. If you're not communicating with the dog properly or, or the sea lion properly, you're going to get bit in the ass. It's going to happen. And it's not the animal's fault. Like it's yours. Then you're dealing with a different species. If we can't like, we're communicating with each other as humans and we have so many communication problems. That's the problem. Like, with everything right we had technical problems just getting this started know, know. Like, <laughs> so then like and then you transfer that to like one species to another you're it it has to be communication issues that are causing the problems people have with their dogs yeah Absolutely. i think that's such a big focus that's missed is like we expect these animals that are completely different species than us just to know our language because like we want it to like okay so what Exactly. And, and we, you know, when, when I worked at the zoo, I learned it. Um, this is another thing. If we got in, if we got bit or there was a mistake, it was on us. Like we got written up, like we got in trouble because it, that we were held to that standard. So it, when I learned that I, as I trained and I was held to that standard, I still hold myself to that standard. So what it does is it, it allows me to, you know, like yesterday, I was working with a dog outside. It was all outside. Um, the owner was more than six feet away. And I'm working I'm working with this shepherd who is 10 months old and has never done anything. Nothing. Dog didn't know how to sit. Nothing. And um, I was trying to get the dog to sit in my normal way, like the way I normally do it. And this dog was like, no, I don't, that's not going to happen. That is not happening. And I I pushed on the butt like I normally do. Like, like, listen, sit. And I the dog turned around and tried to bite me. And I was like, hmm. So I had to figure out some other, like I had to, on the fly, like this is clearly not, I'm not communicating clearly with this dog. So I got to like switch it up somehow. So it's, it, you got to be able to pull from wherever, you know, don't keep, going in the route you know like this dog was like i'm not i'm not doing it well it's up to the dog me tells the, you it's not working and listen to the dog <laughs> right like if you the know? dog tells you i so so i started off with with dogs working in a daycare where i saw a lot of dog bites um because that's daycare life and the one thing like the more i worked there and the more i started to watch the interactions between humans and between dogs and dogs I realized more and more how like every single dog bite that happened, especially when it was on humans, but every dog bite between dogs or humans that happened 
was solely because there was no communication. So the dog took it into its hands to communicate and it did it very well, right? It wanted somebody to get away from it. Totally. And it communicated very well to get away and the person went away. And like, I think the dogs, if we want to learn from dogs a little bit when it comes to communication, dogs know how to communicate really, really well what they do and don't like, right? Yep. And then it's us who's struggling to communicate with them how to how what we really want from them and what to do and all of that. And the thing is that they'll teach us, like you said with the sea line, they'll teach us a lesson right away if it's not a good way to communicate. They'll they'll tell us right away it's not working and it's not going to be in a nice way. They're just going to say that doesn't work, right? And then we're exactly. figuring Hello. something else out. That's exactly. very cool. And that, and you must see a lot. Like I wished I had more. Um, experience with groups of like dog behavior in groups like that's where I think I could learn a lot from you know someone like you in that you know I don't I've not had that I mean I have some and I worked at the facility where they had daycare but it wasn't my sole focus so um, that's where I would like to do more stuff is learning more about dog and dog dog on dog multiple dog interactions and walking yeah. and Group you know. dog interactions is, is, I learned a tremendous amount. Like I don't regret yeah. any of my time in that daycare. Oh. It was great because I learned so much from being, I was with, when I started working there, I'll take a step back. When I started working there, it was basically, here's a spray bottle, like a water spray bottle. Here's a group mm -hmm. of dogs, go in there and keep them quiet, make sure they don't fight. And that was, oh. that was my training. So, <laughs> and I was coming from myself being a dog owner with a reactive dog and I knew nothing about how to deal with it. So it wasn't like I had any background in this. It was just, I wanted to work with dogs. So I went and got a job working with dogs. Um, I didn't even know there was such a thing as dog training then. And I went in there and day after day, I was leaving with a massive headache because it was loud in there and I had no way of controlling it. And I was forced to figure out how to control big groups of dogs there's anywhere from 10 to 30 dogs or 40 dogs at a time like really a very big amount of dogs it was a huge space and they were all in like this dog park area and it was me and one or two other staff in this space wow. and i learned a lot about how to control them without necessarily using tools because i couldn't use tools it wasn't like that it wasn't that type of thing and even if you're going to have e-collars you can't have 50 e-collars hanging on you with a group of dogs you have to have a better no. way to communicate and i learned a lot about like even though some people think this is like a out there idea but literally how your energy affects the dogs that you're oh, with and 100%. like and one thing that i learned a lot about groups of dogs is movement and yes. if you watch let's say a dog park which Guys, if you're going to go to dog park, stay on the outside and just watch. But if you're going to go to a dog park and you watch from the outside, what's going on? There's a big space with dogs in the center and humans on the outside on their phone, right? Humans are always sitting on the benches. They're always out of it. So the dogs are in their own world and it's a dog and human separate situation. If yeah. humans were to stand up and walk into the group and start to move with the dogs, the entire dynamic would change right away. And this was something that I learned from working with these dogs where I would walk into a group of dogs, like 20, 30 dogs, they'd all be all over the place. And I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't say anything. I would just walk in and start to make big rounds throughout the whole group. And every time dogs would congregate, I would walk in between them. And so they have to start to move a little bit. I'd use my body to separate them and just keep moving. And what slowly happens is when you move in a very relaxed state and keep them separated, they're gonna to start to follow you and they start to move and you become the center of that. And it changed the whole dynamic. It was really cool, it was a very cool experience and I learned a lot from it because now I have, I mean, I have my three dogs now and then anytime I have dogs coming in, we have socials and I bring them to the park and they all play together and I take a lot of what I learned from that and transfer it on a day-to-day -day basis with the dogs I'm working with. And even that same idea can transfer to, even if you're working one-on-one -on -one with a dog of how you approach that dog and what you do with that dog and how you're feeling in here, how that affects the dog. And it's, it's tremendous. Like if you're, think about if you're in a very uptight, like you're having a bad day, you're angry, you had a fight with somebody, whatever it is. And then you pick right. up the leash. Good luck getting the dog to, agree with you then he's not going to he's going to feel that you're just not there 
And if you leave and you come back and start over and get yourself into a better state, the dog is going to be receptive to you in a completely different way. It's that is so true. And I always say like, um, I call it going through the motions. <laughs> like don't, if you're going to just go through the motions and you're not going to be in it, just don't, just don't because dogs yeah. know dogs don't lie. Right. Animals. Lie. And they'll tell you, um, they'll tell you everything you need to know about what's going on and they can sense that from you as well. So there's no, I think that's, what's nice about, that's why I love animals. I always have is that there's nothing fake about them. Um, and I don't like fake and, and I'm, I'm pretty, um, I learned, I've learned that from animals just to be present and, you know, I'll just tell you what I think. Um, that's not always a great trait, <laughs> but, um, I get myself in a lot of trouble, but I think my clients generally, you know, the ones that like me, I'd certainly have some that are like, eh. but I'm very honest with them and upfront and, and, and as, as nice as I can be about stuff, but I, but I'm, I like to think that I learned that from working with animals. Yeah. That I learned to be, be upfront and be, just be honest. And dogs, I was recently had this conversation with an owner because they were, they were work. We had a board and train and they were doing really well for a while. And then things started to change. Right. And which, could happen obviously why because there's no everyone knows there's no magic fix to this right and Absolutely. and what i started to speak to them about was i didn't ask them if they're using their e-collar i didn't ask them if they're using their prong collar i asked them about what their day is like with their dog now that it's three months after the boarding train right and slowly they started to tell me how everything was changing in their day-to-day -day life not they were still using the e-collar they were still using yep. the prong collar and what I was telling them is your dog sees through the correction. Your dog sees through the e-collar and the prong collar. They know that on the other side of that, it's all fake. You don't really believe yourself. You don't believe what you're telling them. And that that's not what you really, that's not where you really are. They know it's not. So yep. I can correct the dog at a low level, let's say, if we're going to talk e-collar yeah. and it will work just fine but you are not going to be able to because on the other side of that e-collar correction is somebody who doesn't believe in it is somebody who's bullshitting the rest of their day. Right? Absolutely. 100%. 100%. So, uh, you know, you'll, you'll know, like they'll say, well, how come the dog, how come the dog does it for you, but it won't do it for me. I'm like, because the dog, the dog knows I'm not shitting around. Like they know, I mean what I say. And so, I'm very clear and I'm consistent. That doesn't make it magic. It just makes it what it is. And so um, you want people to understand this. Not it's not it's not rocket science, but it does require um, that your mind be in it, and you have to you have to really believe that you know. Listen. I'm going to be consistent and I'm going to correct you. And I'm always going to correct you for this particular behavior. If you do this, it's always going to result in this blank. Right. Concept. Like if you have a conversation with somebody and they're looking right at you, but you know that they're not hearing a word you're saying, right? Huh? <laughs> that's that's yes. what goes on with so many owners and dogs. It's like the dog knows, he, the dog knows what you're saying, but he knows that like there's nothing really behind it. You don't really care. And, yep. and that's really... Again, like learning from dogs is so powerful in the way that we can communicate with each other. I think that that if we carry that idea over to our interpersonal relationships with people, our whole lives would be so much better with the way we communicate with the, the, the cashier by the store and the way we communicate with our friends and our family will change everything just to be present with them for that quick moment that you're interacting with them. It's, it's so true. And if you, um, I used to be a member of the Marine Mammal Trainers um, Association. It's like, you know, they're like you IACP, there's all, you know, dog trainer, yep. you know, organisms and stuff. And when you use positive reinforcement to train, you find that you use it in your everyday life. I find that I use dog training with people all the time. So it's just a, like a natural thing so like you'll reward somebody like you'll be at the store and somebody will help you thank you you know you're like very it's not fake i mean i mean it right but but it but it's almost like a lifestyle like you you know you you find yourself um using it 
all the time and it works beautifully, but it's it real. Work. It's the yeah, way, yeah. it's not just a dog thing. Like we all love positive reinforcement and we all yeah. need the clarity of knowing when we've done something wrong. We all need balanced training in our lives. Like yeah. it's not just for dogs. Like, <laughs> not, it's not. I mean, spoiled it kids happen because they're not being taught with balanced training and spoiled adults also, I guess. It's all the same. We need it all. We need both sides of it. It's so true. And my, I have two daughters. They're both in college now. And they knew from the very beginning that if there was something, if I told them, to, if I said something and it didn't get followed, the rule didn't get followed, there would always be a consequence. And it wasn't, I wasn't mad. I didn't scream at them, but they knew that the consequence was coming. They earned it. And so they, they found comfort in that. I, I think, um, you know, they were, they were like, mom, you were kind of like, you know, we're like a little scared of you kind of, you know, like, you know, they would, they would, they, they knew though, they knew that, Hey, it is what it is. You, I told you not to do that. You did it. So here we are. And I followed through and the follow through, I think is what makes all the difference. Right. And, and, dogs. and on the other end of it, I'm sure that there was also, a healthy level of positive reinforcement that let them know when you were proud of them and when they were doing the right thing. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And, to and me, it's such, a simple, yeah. it's such a simple idea that it's, it's almost, it almost mind boggling that it's like people don't agree with it and don't get it because it just makes so much logical sense to me that like society yeah. needs both in order to exist. We don't go to work if we're not getting paid, but we also right. know that if we don't go to work, we lose our jobs and we end up on the street. And we need both. both. We need that. Exactly. Right. Yep. Let's see what's going on. Say to people, it seems, and like it's so it's so stupid. It's it's so easy. It's stupid. I always say that all the time. I'm like, this is so simple. The the concept is so simple that it's stupid. It's it's yes and it's no. Yeah. It's good and it's no. You know what I mean? Like it's not it's not rocket science. It really it's not. Dan said everything to the simplest form. Yes, I like that. No, I don't like that. Exactly. It's just keeping yep. it simple and it's so it's so clear that way we all we all thrive on that That's oh yeah i i can't stand it and so like i know i don't know if you're like this but um i find that animal trainers especially people that dealt with animals their their whole lives it, it really get in you can sort of read a room very well like i can walk in and i can like scan and nobody needs to say anything like I can pick up like who's that girl doesn't like that girl. And you know, this one is, you know, the whole and, dynamic of that room right away. <laughs> exactly. And it doesn't, it's just not always good. Sometimes I don't want to know, like sometimes I'm like, you know, but I also can tell like if somebody's um, full of crap, like saying something to me, I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. You know? Yeah. Well on a but, daily basis, we're forced to in a, in a good way forced to, communicate without being verbal all the time and to pick up on that communication that's coming to us because no matter how verbal we are with a dog they're never going to one day open their mouth and talk back to us all their communication is going to be nonverbal, right so yep. if we're not picking up on that that's how we get bit that's how we mess up so we're oh, forced, we're forced to connect to that part of our mind that so many humans just don't even realize that we naturally have it because we all communicate without verbal cues all the time our body language says so much but most people oh, okay. tune that part out because they rely so much on verbal language. But mm -hmm. with animal trainers, dog trainers, we have to rely on that so much because we're working with beings that can't communicate verbally, but they are talking to us all the time. We have to be able to pick up on that. And you have to be good at it. Yeah. And, and I also think that there's a part of me that thinks that there are some people that, you know, you can do it, but there's some people that are really good at it. Like sort of, sort of get it innately, intuitively understand how to, how that works. And, um, but you can certainly fine tune it and, and working with birds, I'm going to tell you that, that will completely um, change the whole way you see um, nonverbal cues. I'm about to give myself a chicken or something. A while ago, I, a while ago, I saw a working dog kennel. I don't remember which one it was. I, I went down like a Facebook rabbit hole of like dog training pages. Oh, uh, 
Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and I found the working dog kennel where they had every student that would come through there would train a mm-hmm. chicken with, yep. with clicker training would work with the chicken. And I thought that was so fascinating and it makes total sense with what you're saying, why they would do that. It's, it, it, it's such a cool thing. I mean, I, I don't regret, I mean, I, I'm so thankful for the, um, the experience that I've had and the ability, like, so if working with large birds of prey, they're pretty, you know, though they're, they're pretty badass. but when you're dealing with like, um, pre, uh, prey animals, like animals that are, um, you know, like rabbits or, you know, small pigeons or, you know, prey animals they are very good at hiding what they're thinking because right. they, they have, have to. to so that's what made you know the 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 non bird of prey birds where, where i worked in the birdhouse at the st louis zoo learn um you know this bird's off a little bit and the vets would say well what do you mean and we would say i don't know i just there's something off and They always listen. We're getting cut off for a little bit over there. Um, yeah, I saw that. Can you can you hear is me? Your, <laughs> is your internet connection good? Yeah, it's really good. Okay, okay, I think we're back. That's good. Okay. All right, just just to make our our technical difficulties a little bit more fun, so we have it continuing. Okay. So I'm curious. Now that you made that transition from, so beforehand you were mostly working with animals. You didn't have any human interaction for the most part during your day. It was just animals, 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 right? When you worked in the zoo. Well, no, we did. I did have question with um, people because zookeepers had to go out and just and talk about their animals and be, um, you know, in front of the public, and that was something I had to learn how to do. Um, didn't love it, but I, you know, I had to, that was part of it. So I did interact with the public quite a bit. Um, and even, you know, so, uh, but animals were my thing. I mean, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, you know. So what made you make that switch? To dogs? Mm-hmm. Um, so I had a baby and I was doing, um, uh, a bird show at the time in Baltimore that was at the Baltimore zoo. And, um, you know, there's no part time at the zoo, right? It's all or nothing. And it's, it's incredibly, um, demanding. Um, and so I took some time off, um, because I had a baby and then I needed part time and they just couldn't, they couldn't do it. So, um, you know, I was done at that point and it was really hard because I loved it so much. Um, and then I, you know, I took time off to raise two kids and then we moved back to Chicago and that's when I started, you know, I went back to the zoo for a little bit. Um, and it was too hard. It was too far. I live pretty far away and Chicago Mm -hmm. traffic is horrendous. So, um, you know, I tried doing it for a while and I was like this, you know, six days on two days off rotating it was just it's a nightmare so um i just started volunteering at the shelter and that's when i discovered i could train dogs like this isn't that far off right you know? so what's your favorite part of tr- of working with dogs now that how long have you been working with dogs oh gosh i guess it's been about six years now cool and what, what do you love about it you know i really like dealing with the anxious dogs, the nervous dogs. Um, and I like using an e-collar to sort of, I guess, unlock the dog that's inside. That's just yeah. covered up by all this anxiety that when I, the way that I, you know, that we use e-collars, it's, it's like magic almost. I mean, it's, it's the oh. coolest thing to watch. It's really cool. And, um, you feel for the dog and you feel for the owners because it's so hard. And, you know, they've got this dog that's like a spinning nightmare, you know, in its own head, like a total crackhead. And when you can fix that and make that dog calm for the first time in its life and you see the eyeballs like, Oh, 
you know, it kind of like they get it. I find that really rewarding. I don't know how you feel about that, but I really love yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a, I think it's, it's like you said, and you used the word like magical, I think, right? And it really is almost like a magical experience to see because you're taking a dog that it's, it's mind is so wound up and it's out of control in such an unhealthy way. Like I feel for these animals. I would never want to be in that state. And I feel for owners of dogs who are like that. It's so, it's so hard. Like it's almost worse than aggression, I think, because you're dealing with an animal that's just suffering mentally, really, right? It's like a mental illness. And well, you're... that's how I see it. What? That's exactly how I see it. Yeah. And and it's like it's almost like you're you're freeing them, you're healing them in a sense. And I think it's it's a beautiful thing to be a part of. Like I, I feel so blessed that I can get to do that for people and for the dogs. It's so cool. And like one of my favorite parts of that especially work if i'm working with anxious dogs which i haven't had an anxious dog in a while the dog i have right now is so chill i don't even know why he's with me he's awesome <laughs> but i love it i love i love those kind of dogs They're the best. but he's like just he's just so chill like i put him on place the first time and he just went to sleep but um awesome. but like working with really anxious dogs one of my favorite parts of that is seeing the owner get to really connect with who their dog really is because that anxiety yes. and that stress that's not who the dog really is there's a whole nother animal under there that's so beautiful and like so many dogs yeah. never get to reveal that part of themselves so many owners never get to connect with that part of their dog and it's such yeah. a beautiful thing to see them take that leash go for the walk for the first time together like be able to communicate because that whole fog is lifted it's so beautiful yeah. i that's the best i just had a dog that was so bad um she was so skinny that i was like you know, is she okay? She was just a complete crackhead. And we managed to get through to her. And they were so happy that this was this was the dog that they envisioned they had. But they, they couldn't even get, the kids couldn't even play with her because she was yeah. so insane. And, you know, he's, this dog just turned, made a complete turnaround. And it was really fun to watch the owner's the, especially the wife who was afraid of the dog um finally get to walk her and it was it's just so cool to watch it's great it's such a great feeling right yeah. it's it's like it's like we're we're get to be that bridge that bridges the gap between the owner and dog and i yes. like i i have my first dog my marley he was my wild child he's the one who got me into all of this and oh really and he like we always had a connection. So it wasn't like bridging that gap, but I could relate to the idea of like finally being able to walk your dog down the street without him trying to kill everyone and things like that. And like, it's, it's a yeah. great feeling. Right. <laughs> and then when you take it even further and you're like, now you have off leash freedom and like, now you have a dog yeah. that can go places with you. And it's like, we, we open up a, a whole new world to these, to these owners and to their dogs. It's a really cool thing that we get to do. It is. I call it, I sort of say like, I'm a coach sometimes yes like, like i say you know i'm just your coach like you got to do the work and i'll walk you through it but you ultimately have to do the hard stuff and and you know um and obviously i'm the person they go to you know to, to explain all of it and get them you know they do their homework but um it's really fun i really enjoy it how long have you been working with dogs um so i started off working in the daycare I want to say five or six years ago. Um, okay. Not sure exactly. And I started off just walking dogs and working in the daycare part of the place. It was a really big facility. So it was daycare, boarding, training, grooming, pickup, drop offs, like a full. The only thing they didn't have there was a vet. It was everything you could need for a dog. Um, wow. Yeah, it was a massive operation. And I started off walking dogs there and working in the daycare. And I immediately fell in love with working with dogs. And I knew like, this is what I have to do. I didn't know which aspect of it I was going to do yet, but I knew I had to work with dogs. Um, and then I started to notice how many dogs struggled with the same things that my dog had struggled with previous to that. And how many owners were struggling. And that like, I wasn't, I, I thought that my dog was crazy. And that I just like had a crazy dog, which I did, yeah. but 
I wasn't <laughs> the only one. Like there was, this was like the average dog. And there was yeah. a massive need for like these owners needed help. So I fell in love with the idea of the behavioral aspect of it. Um, and I eventually started training dogs there. I, I went to like a training class for a little bit in New York and eventually started training dogs there at the facility. Um, and I went to T3 about, what was it, two summers ago now? Yeah, two summers ago. And then I, right the week after I left T3, I told them I was leaving the facility and starting my own business right away. And then I've been doing that since. It's been really awesome. And I got to meet so many awesome people. I love T3. I got to meet so many. I I still have. So it was, it, you know, there's like a core group of us. Julie, Barber, mm -hmm. um, Perry Harris, Heather Arthur, um, Sabrina. Like um, we we all went to T3 together. And so we've, we've still stayed in really close contact. And I still talk to them every other day or so. I mean, like we're very connected. So it, it was a, it was life changing for me for sure. You know, that's yeah. when I decided on my own as well. So um, it was after that, you know, I, you know, um, learning what I learned and uh, meeting all those people and having that support. That was really nice. But Yeah. I got so much out of, I never realized that there was, a community in the dog training world of any sort. Like I, didn't know. I thought it was the opposite until like I actually, and one of the cool things that since going to T3 that I've had in my life is, so I started putting myself out there a lot. Right. And like really yeah. putting a lot of, a lot of content out and social media and all it's that awesome. stuff. And the amount yeah. of people that I've gotten to connect with because of that. To me, it's like, even if I don't get any clients from my content, the fact that I get yeah. to, like, I talk to cool people who like used to train animals at zoos and like yeah. all sorts of cool things that I never imagined I would be talking to anyone like that. And like, we get to connect all around the world. I mean, think about what's going on right now. Like we're all stuck in our homes because of the craziness what's going on out there, but we yeah. get to connect through it all because of these communities that we've built that we're all still together. I think it's beautiful. It's really cool. Um, I really love that, that we're, I'm able to talk to still and, and hang out and have this like group of people that I can talk to and get um, information from. And I think you've gone, like you are way more um, um, courageous than I am. And I watch your stuff and I just love it. And I think, God, yeah, I'm so, you know, he's, you're so good at it. Thank and you. you're good at, you know, you're really good at putting content out there and, and it's, and it's not like just content, it's you content. Like it's that, that people can really use and really understand. And I think that that's, you know, when people try to overcomplicate dog training, that's when you lose people, you know, I you think start talking about and conditioning and all yeah. this. I mean, like they don't nobody wants to know i don't think it. owners so, I mean, care about that shit i don't think owners care like owners have don't. a dog i i tell this to every dog owner like you're not supposed to be a dog trainer like it's great yeah. if it's great if we know about operant conditioning and we should know it i think dog trainers should learn all these things but then we should be able to take all those things that are complicated and have a lot to it and that we spend a lot of time studying we should be able to take mm -hmm. all of that and make it that we can explain it in two or three sentences for every single owner to be able to use it. And if we can't do that, we're ultimately not doing our job because we're not supposed to be yeah. training random owners to become dog trainers. We're supposed to be training them to be able to be have a good life with their dog. That's it. Like Totally. Absolutely. And I think it's, um, I went and did a shadow with Ted Eftimiatis up in awesome. Mango Dogs. He, oh my God, he, so he taught, I, I knew this before I went in there, but it was really cool. Cause he was just like, you know, he said, I used to explain, you know, I'd go through the whole four quadrants and we would, I would explain it to people. And he's like, you know, they don't care. They're, they, you, you, you lose them. You know, yeah. they're just not, they want you to fix their dog. They want you to train them to do, to do the work. So, you know, he was like, here's what I say. You teach the dog to turn the collar off. That, right. That's it. So teach the dog to turn the collar off. That's all they know. You know what I mean? Like, I could explain what that means in 
which quadrant that is, but they don't care. Right. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter. So, you know, if you simplify it and make it so that people understand it, you have to distill it. You know what I mean? Like you take it, you take the information that you understand intimately, you know, you know what negative reinforce the difference between negative reinforcement and punishment is. Most people don't. They right. think it's the same it thing. It sounds the same to the average mind. It sounds the same. Negative is punishment. Why not? Right. They think that's what it is. It's not, but that's what they think it is. And so what is my, what is the point of me explaining that? Spending 20 minutes explaining the difference between what a, what a negative reinforcer is and what a punisher is. Right. I mean, when, it doesn't matter. You know, when an owner, when an owner comes for training with any trainer out there, they are so most of the time, especially I think with us balanced trainers, most of the time they're at a point where they're at their wits end, right? Oh, they're struggling. Absolutely. They need help. They don't want someone and they have jobs and many of them have kids and their own life yep. going on and they don't want yep. someone giving them some whole long college class. Like they don't give a shit. It's like, <laughs> I have this problem. Can you solve it? And if you can't solve the yep. problem, then I'll find someone else who could, but I don't right. really care what you're going to do and how it works. I want to know that it works. That's the bottom right. line, right? That's our job. Like yep. take the complicated shit and bring it down to its, simplest possible form and deliver it yeah. and that's it. that's it that's it it's like coaching it's the same thing like i don't they just don't need to know all that stuff they yeah. don't want to know it and you know how do i fix how do i fix a dog that's pulling on a leash easy i don't need to explain it to you here that's here right. here it is here it exactly. is exactly you know I mean? like, and they're like yes you know this is the first time i've been able to walk my dog that, and they're happy with that. Yeah, that's all know? they need. It's so simple. It's a, owners want simplicity. That's it. Most people want simplicity. That's that's it makes life so much easier. It does. And you have to also remember, and I always try to remember this, not everybody is as interested in dogs as we are. But yeah, you know, tough, I'm, right? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I love this crap, but not everybody's like, you know, a big dog geek like we are. And, you know, like I do, this is so funny. I, um, when I see that a dog is getting it and they finally do it, I'm like, yes. Oh yes. my God. That's what, you know, so and I get super stupid and their the owners are looking at me like, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so exciting to us. We celebrate. But, I turn on music and I'm dancing in my basement with the dogs. Like, this is awesome shit, you know. And and the owners are like, um, he's okay. Yeah. And, but I, it, they don't get it. But I think they like that I'm so excited. I'm enthusiastic about it. But not ev not your your owners do not get that excited about it. Right. So got to remember that, you know. One of the cool things that about the board and train, and I know you don't do board and trains. I think there's pros and cons to both of them. And I've done both of them. I started off only doing one-on-ones. So I, I, I know both sides of it. Yeah. One of the cool things about a board and train is when it's finished, it's almost like here's a finished product. So yes. it feels it feels bigger to the owner, yeah. right? Oh, On the does. other end of it, it's like if you do one-on-ones, it's you're also having the owner work the dog more. So they feel more like they're doing it. So there's, there's a lot to both sides. It's very cool. Yeah, it is very cool. I like doing both. I like both. Yeah. I would like to figure out a way to, to incorporate one-on-ones into the board and train more. That's something that I like to, I think it would be cool to have the owners more involved in the board and train program. And I think, I think it makes a huge difference in the end. Yeah. If you have them come like um, I did a, you know, they would come the first week and get a lesson in that first week and see where the dog is. And we right. teach them, you know, it wasn't finished, but they could see and then they could sort of be a part of the process. So it wasn't like they didn't have anything to do with it. They, right. they were part of it. Yeah, for sure. It keeps them involved and that's an important part of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what's one thing you wish every dog owner knew? It's one thing I wish every dog owner knew that dogs love boundaries. They they live for it. They live to be to be given the rules. Dogs love rules. They really really do. 
I, I wish people, that. yeah, they, I wish more owners would embrace that rather than, you know, well, he just wants to sleep in my bed. He was rescued and I want to give him love. Like I get it, yeah. but boundaries are bound. Setting boundaries is love to me. It's so contrary to like, like pop media belief is that like, what is it? What does everyone grow up knowing that dogs love to please? Right. And that yes. dogs like that, like they match and, and we get it from like, from media, right? Like, like, lassie and like all the famous dogs like all they wanted to do was please the person in the movie right yes and that's like our image of what dogs are supposed to be growing up and like how everyone sees it and then like this mean dog trainer comes in and it's like no your dog wants rules like your dog wants to be yeah. told no your dog wants to be told what to do <laughs> and it's like it's, it's such a mindset shift but it is such a powerful shift when owners actually get to see that in action and they get to actually live it and realize how much more comfortable their dog is really and how, how much more fulfilled the dog is. Well, I agree. And I think that the difference between a well-trained dog, when you're doing one-on-ones, I think the success hinges on that, on owners, <clears throat> on owners grasping that concept and owning okay. it. And if they don't, you know, if they don't make that a part of the dog's life and say, listen, my dog's going to need boundaries and this is how the shift is, it doesn't, it, I find that the success is not nearly as good as when they really wrap their minds around it and they're like, okay, here's how it's going to go. 100%. It's the same with board and trains even, right? Absolutely. Like in order for it to mm -hmm. continue, it's the owner continuing it. It's. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, like if, if owners understood how much they play a role in their dog's behavior, they wouldn't need dog trainers as much. They would they would probably oh. still need us, but not yeah. even close to as much because they right away recognize that half the problem falls on them, right? And like back to how we started yeah. the whole conversation, it all started yeah. from 100% responsibility. And it's so it's yeah. that's, that's so big. Cool. Yeah. It's so yep. cool. All right. If anybody has any comments, let's see. Let's see what's going on in our comments. We didn't look at those in a while. Paige says it's moments like that when you realize. Oh, I think she was talking about helping with anxiety dogs. Yeah, it is fun. I love that. Terry, Terry. we love you too. <laughs> love Harris. Yes, Terry, we're gonna get you on here next. Yes, Terry, you gotta do it. We're gonna get him on. All right. So, Megan, where can people find you if they want to work with you if they're in the Chicago area? So if you um, go on to Facebook, I have Megan Trains Dogs Facebook page. You can reach me there. Um, I'm on the south side. You know, Chicago's ginormous. So, um, you know, I, I'm in the southern suburbs of Chicago. So anywhere in that area, you can find me, um, you know, working dogs. Oop. Oops, what happened there? I have no oh. idea. I didn't touch anything. <laughs> oh, I thought I, I didn't there. touch a thing. Okay, we're back. I was gonna, sh I was gonna okay. show everybody your Facebook page. I think that we did that quickly. Oh. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'm new to this okay. program, so I'm still figuring it out. But I know that there's a way that I can put up uh, your Facebook page to show everybody. But yeah, so yeah, so that's where you find me. And um, and what is it? Megan trains dogs. Mm -hmm. Megan trains dogs. Julie Barber came up with that at T3. Good job, Julie. Um, that yeah, Julie did that. Um, and so, you know, my contact information is there and you reach me that way. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, now that we got it figured out. Yes, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. It was a lot of fun. Stay healthy. Stay happy. Be kind. Yes. Be gentle to yes, yourselves, guys. It's a tough time out there. Love you all. Bye.